Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you all today. Um, the, uh, the invite is very, very much uh, appreciated. So um, I will, uh, this is the, just the title slide so that you know who I am. Um, I have no financial connection to this talk. I do, some of my research relates to some of this, but I don't have any financial interests um, myself. So um, when I was asked to uh, give this talk, um, I initially had, you know, just looked at what had really advanced within uh, within oncology um, from a research perspective. And so those are the mostly the bottom four uh, bullet points that you see there. Um, and uh, and then I realized I can't have a talk these days without mentioning COVID-19. Um, and so I will start a little bit with that because I think it actually is fascinating the uh, degree to which um, science has uh, evolved over the last year in the midst of COVID-19 and in, in large part spurned by uh, that pandemic. So uh, I, I will start with that. Um, I will cover what, uh, what I think is a um, is still very new area in immunotherapy, and many of you would be familiar with this already, um, and really look at what may, some of the next uh, steps are going to be from, a, from an immunotherapy perspective, uh, especially in the relation to cancer vaccines. Um, I will spend some time talking about artificial intelligence and big data, and that's an area of interest of mine in particular. Um, I will spend just a few minutes on health services research. I think this is an area that needs more attention and is finally, I think, getting more attention um, in uh, from a funding perspective uh, with, a, with a number of big teams uh, now being able to apply for funding. And then I would like to end just with uh, some ideas around novel clinical trial designs, uh, because as uh, I think you would all know, um, the way that we learn um, in, uh, in science, in medicine, and definitely within oncology um, is through clinical trials. Um, and so finding the best way to, um, to uh, do clinical trials the most efficient way, I think is so important and needs to be highlighted. So uh, just a, a couple of days ago, as I was finishing off the talk, uh, I looked in PubMed which is our uh, the electronic database uh, where we look for research publications, and so it is only for uh, it is only really uh, for studies that have been indexed there. It doesn't include all of them uh, that have been published, um, and only those that actually have been published, either accepted um, or or in in the uh, online or um, paper versions of journals. And if you look if you search for COVID nineteen and cancer. Um, there were already 5,381 publications as of a couple of days ago, uh, which is just unbelievable. That's within the course of a year. That's a, and there was, of course, none published in 2019 and before. So it's really all just in the last uh, 10, 11 months, which is very, very uh, incredible, if you ask me. What we know from this uh, research, um, and, and because it's just so critically important to how we approach uh, patients, is that uh, there appears to be a higher likelihood of infection um, and, uh, and there appears to be a higher likelihood of uh, severe outcomes. So what you see on the bottom left corner, um, you may be able to see my pointer, um, is that if you look at uh, the um, comorbid factors, the pre-existing medical history that patients bring uh, to the table if they were to get COVID-19, any type of cancer is associated with 2.2 um, with, uh, uh, times uh, likelihood um, of uh, developing the illness uh, and being diagnosed. And so that's a very significant uh, number to have more than double what you'd expect. Um, and there were already 20 you know, publications uh, looking at that. And then on the right-hand side, this is way too small for anyone to see, uh, but hopefully you can see the um, the trend, um, which is which is unfortunate, uh, but tells us that the outcomes are uh, on average worse for patients who have uh, cancer and develop COVID-19. And so um, this is uh, on average a 25% worse outcome. Um, and so I, I obviously highlight that as something of importance. I uh, wish it was an advance that was positive, 
Um, but at least we've identified these risks and can have that discussion with patients. Um, we've recently been involved in how the health system has responded to this. And so part of my health services um, interest is really in what the health system has done. And so this is currently under review uh, at Current Oncology. Um, but we essentially asked all of the provincial cancer agencies um, what has changed for them uh, as a result of COVID-19. Um, and we're able to get some very interesting results. Um, initially, for example, all the screening programs stopped and they've reopened. And even though um, there's now, of course, a very significant uh, second uh, wave that we're all going through, uh, many of these programs are still staying open because we've, we're now prepared, this health system is prepared to accept them uh, and, and in a safe way to accept patients. Um, radiology was reduced, so the number of scans that people had went down uh, and access to it went down. Again, that's back up uh, for the most part. New referrals went down as patients were not presenting and there were fewer, uh, fewer operations happening or biopsies happening. One big change was in-person visits, and, and so many of you may have experienced this with your own physicians, but essentially many, uh, many um, visits were switched to telephone or to video, uh, which I think is a very interesting and dramatic shift uh, that has some positive repercussions, I hope, for patients um, as we go forward. Um, there was restriction on who could join patients in their visits, especially um, across the country. This was essentially everywhere said, you know, you, you can either only have one or uh, only in certain circumstances, can someone join you at your in-person visit? Um, and often, you know, you can't join any for, you can't join the patient for treatment um, or, or uh, wait for them in the building. Uh, surgical volumes were decreased. Um, and surprisingly, only some minor changes were noted in radiation treatment plans and chemotherapy treatment plans. We hope that there will be some things that will that will stay as a result of this advance um, because it really shifted the system so dramatically and quickly. One is uh, is the uh, emphasis on uh, video or virtual visits, um, and uh, and so I think uh, you know the fact that some patients have difficulty getting out to appointments um, is really facilitated if they can get uh, a conversation. Um, with the uh, with their care team, with their physician, go over results. Um, you know, this is something that obviously phones existed uh, before, but uh, it was not seen as a valuable way to provide service, and and certainly wasn't uh, in most places something that physicians uh, could bill for, and so there was not very much uptake of it. Um, uh, video visits is a whole other uh, game where I think people are becoming very familiar with how to use that plat those platforms, and uh, you know it's really um, helpful when you're having especially conversations that are very serious around cancer treatment and prognosis and and trying to um, go over very significant discussions with families. You can see them, and it's a big difference rather than over the phone. Um, you can also patch in people from, you know, family members from other households or from other provinces or around the world to these visits, which is also remarkable. Um, I think there'll be a, an emphasis on remote monitoring. I certainly hope so, um, that patients can do some of their own care and take some of, uh, feel empowered to do that. Um, it also forced, I think, the medical system to be a little bit more open about goals of care discussions um, and, uh, and to improve the coordination within the health system itself. Um, I think some of that may be to be determined, but in any event, that's all I wanted to talk about COVID-19 directly. Um, so in terms of immunotherapy, um, I wanted to highlight a couple of points. So the, the images that you see here are uh, for what's been immunotherapy for the last, I'll say five, but probably longer years, very standard treatment uh, now for some cancers, such as melanoma and lung cancer, et cetera. And the, and the use of these checkpoint inhibitors is really gaining traction. So I don't, I'm not going to focus on it, but just to show you um, that it really is uh, affecting the way that the immune system interacts with a tumor cell. And so you're basically uh, blocking the kind of these these receptors here that I'm circling that are in blue. Um, and so you can see when you add um, 
something that blocks an anti-PD-1 or an anti-PD-L1 uh, drug, antibody, et cetera, that um, you will actually turn off the brake, so to speak, uh, for the immune system. It will recognize the tumor cell as foreign. And then the immune system will take care of that cell uh, and kill it as though it was an invader, uh, which is, I think, fascinating. And so this has obviously been very beneficial. The, on the right, you'll see this diamond showing that it did in first line therapy for lung cancer, there's actually a very substantial um, improvement in overall survival with the use of these drugs. And so that's established already. I'll speak a few minutes about cancer vaccines and CAR T therapy, as I think those are major advances that have been around conceptually for quite a while, but are now starting to really take hold. So one of those uh, is cancer vaccines. Um, where essentially you would potentially grow that. So there are a couple of, a couple of ways to do this rather, I should say. So to back up a little bit, um, one way is to grow the patient's immune cells. So their T cells or dendritic cells, um, the so-called an, uh, antigen presenting cells um, in, uh, in something that contains cancer antigens. So these are the things that the body could identify as being cancer and not uh, its own its own self. Um, and so that's an important thing. You can grow them up and stimulate them with these cancer antigens. That's one way to do it. The other way would be to inject these antigens, um, not the cancer itself, of course, but just the, the small components of it and have your immune system recognize these components. And so um, I think this will be an area that grows. Um, there's a lot of actually uh, development in this in this field um, right now it's being used for the prevention of cancer, which is of course where we would like to be for all of this rather than just focusing on treatment. Um, but it prevents, you know, the human papillomavirus related, um, cancers, especially cervical cancer and oropharyngeal cancers, um, and hepatitis B, which is very important worldwide for, uh, cancer of the liver. Um, and so, um, you, we know that we can prevent cancers with the use of these vaccines. Um, it's now being studied more for the treatment of cancer. And so, um, so some of this work, uh, this, so the bottom left image there of the globe, uh, maybe those numbers aren't coming through well for you, but is to show the number of clinical trials that are currently available on clinicaltrials.gov that, that, that label cancer vaccine or vaccine and cancer in the, um, in the uh, um, description of the study. And so in the United States, that's you know, almost 1400. Uh, and globally, there are hundreds of trials open um, in, uh, in many parts of the world looking at cancer vaccines. Largely, these are looking at um, finding you know, whether the target that was chosen is really effective. And so on the right hand side of the screen, you can see conceptually what they're doing is we're identifying um, parts of the cancer genome, the tumor genome. So this is the DNA of the cancer or components of the cancer that could be recognized by the immune system as cancer and not as something else. And in fact, they're using um, machine learning to help identify that. And um, then, uh, as I mentioned, either injecting that directly or growing that with, uh, growing the uh, person's immune cells with that antigen injecting it back to see if that would be effective. I think that's going to uh, be a very interesting thing over the coming years um, as this technology takes hold and can, can really be leveraged. And certainly there's been a lot in the news around vaccines lately. Uh, I think this would be, uh, you know, some of the potential advances are tremendously uh, encouraging uh, in this space. One of the other um, very important developments um, that is, uh, you know, has been made over the past many years um, and is now being studied in multiple indications um, is the use of CAR T therapy. And CAR T is really the use of uh, T cells where essentially they are uh, they are um, extracted from the patient um, and then um, we modify the T cell receptor. Uh, we, <laughs> of course, the, the lab modifies T cell receptor and then they're grown um, and then injected back in. The modification of this T cell receptor is 
is for a very to recognize a very specific, very, very specific component of the cancer cell so that it is, again, recognized as foreign to the body and killed by the immune system. Uh, and so it's fascinating area I've been used for many types of cancers already, mostly the hematologic cancers. Uh, even uh, as Tracy had mentioned, um, glioblastoma being one of uh, the cancers that I treat and patients that I treat uh, with glioblastoma, um, studies showing that um, you can actually get pretty substantial responses in a subset of patients with glioblastoma. So very encouraging for both um, blood cancers and solid cancers. And I think they'll be much more developed in this regard over the coming years. Um, and so just to give you a sense, um, this is uh, basically to show that, that you can get uh, dramatic response rates in, a, in cases where this is relapsed or refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where the response rate to conventional so-called salvage chemotherapy could range from 10 to 40%, depending on what's used and the patients it's used in, to now you know, up to 90% of patients seeing a response and a durable response with the use of CAR-T therapy. It has a, it's a very dramatic, um, dr dramatic uh, improvement. And uh, hopefully this will be translated through many more cancers. I guess just to highlight, these are very expensive <laughs> uh, treatments, uh, you know, in, in the um, high six or seven figures for a single treatment. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, I think going to be one of the struggles for a universal health system like ours as to how we pay for these. Um, but if you're not subjecting patients to ongoing therapy, improving outcomes so dramatically, um, and it's essentially a one-time or very minimal intervention uh, at a certain time point, um, yeah, obviously those benefits are going to be, uh, need to be quantified uh, and it has a pretty, um, a potential to be revolutionary, I think, um, for the cancers where it's shown to be beneficial. So that is what I wanted to talk about with the um, immunotherapy angle. Um, I want to then spend a few minutes, I know, as I said, like this is an area of interest of mine, the artificial intelligence and machine learning area. And I wanted to just go through this a little bit. There are a few things that I might gloss over uh, depending on time, uh, because there are still a few of the things I wanted to cover, of course. But uh, first of all, I wanna go through a little bit about what machine learning is and what artificial intelligence is, um, what some of its challenges are, how it's being used now, and what some of those opportunities are for the future. So machine learning is essentially, uh, you know, a software that learns from uh, experience and not, uh, and, and how well it performed a task and not something that a programmer has explicitly programmed to do. So it is able to, you know, get very slight improvements, but do that, you know, thousands of times to get very, very good at uh, at a certain task. And so uh, it'll become more clear when I start to talk, I think about what, how it's being used, but it's really um, interesting um, development within statistics and data science that has, has uh, as well as increased computing capacity that's really enabled this over the last many years. Um, so, uh, so, there are a few terms to at least be aware of. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, which is a more general term. And then within machine learning, there's an even smaller subset that is uh, a different way of having the computer um, uh, evaluate, interrogate, and learn from the data using something called neural networks. And I'm not gonna get into that in much detail, but essentially, all of the focus right now is on the use of neural networks and deep learning for the various applications because uh, A, it's now possible and B, um, through very little um, manual curation of the data, um, the, uh, the, the machine, the computer is able to classify things very quickly, which is a remarkable advance. So some of the other parts and that natural language processing being one of them is, uh, is another thing to be aware of. And that is a 
that is part of uh, part of artificial intelligence is being able to read language. So it basically breaks language into chunks of data that the computer can uh, understand. Um, and that's actually a difficult process. Uh, it may seem silly, but it's a very difficult process actually for a computer to do. We're now all familiar with it because uh, you know Siri has been around for a long time, uh, or the Amazon Alexa or what have you. Um, you know, interacting. It's remarkable how simple that seems these days, uh, but it is not trivial. And uh, of course, predictive text. When you're typing in a Google search, it knows what you kind of want already. That's the same process that's happening. So I mentioned a little bit about why now this is happening because there's a lot more data available. Um, and, uh, and for years now, I think we've been more aware of the value of that, those data. Um, the, uh, there are new techniques and these algorithms are being developed uh, actively uh, within industry. Uh, so with, you know, with companies, but also in academics. And so I think that there's a lot of uh, work being done on these techniques to improve them. And we now have faster computers. And so being able to perform very complex um, calculations quickly is is uh, is growing uh, exponentially every year. So that's those are the major reasons why it's happening now. And so I'll, I'll briefly talk about um, how it's being used in research, the machine learning and AI forms that are being used in research. And those will be mostly natural language processing of things like notes, and reports, pathology, radiology reports, um, image analysis. So actually reading images and trying to identify um, features within those uh, either, uh, you know, CT or MRIs or pathology slides of the, of the, uh, the histology slides of the, of the cancer. Um, classifying disease using omics. So you might have heard of omics. It's a broad classification of things like genomics uh, or metabolomics or proteomics, just looking at very small components of biology and how they can change and how we can classify disease based on, uh, based on uh, small differences in, uh, in, in those things. It's also being used for decision support. Uh, I may or may not have an example. I can't remember later um, about that. So natural language processing then, as I said, you know, we use it all the time. Spell checks may be one of the simplest uh, identi uh, you know, ideas around this where it can identify that you, know, you, you added a T when you shouldn't have or whatever and identify that for you. But others, spam filters use natural language processing. The voice to text is a big one now and voice to command is a big one. So um, one of the ways that this is being used for research and, um, is extracting information. So historically and still today, in so many ways, um, medicine uses free text. You know, I will handwrite in a chart, not very often anymore. I will type into a chart, uh, but it's a, it's a sentence. It's something that I've come up with. It's not like I'm clicking a button on a computer or just entering a number. I do that sometimes, but often it's just free text. And getting information out of the system after that's happened is actually very cumbersome. So you have to, someone has to read it and pull out what I mean. So um, if I write, you know, um, the uh, cancer responded to treatment, um, that's something that a human easily understands, but I can't, that's not something that you can automatically pull from uh, an electronic system to analyze for outcomes at least not yet. And so, in fact, we have embarked on a uh, uh, on work in this regard, looking at identifying uh, from clinical notes, the notes that I might type or dictate into the system, whether a cancer has recurred or not. Um, and this might seem very small, but it's actually one of the harder things to identify um, whether a cancer has recurred or not using this uh, using this this um, technique, and so we've used kind of uh, the, both the uh, older style natural language processing, where it reads things, uh, reads the text, and puts it into chunks and identifies this phrase is recurrence. You know, even if I say it slightly differently than the person sitting next to me, um, and we're now using the deep learning technique with neural networks that's that 
uh, that is looking for features of these uh, reports that would uh, relate to the cancer having recurred or not. Um, and so ultimately, um, pulling this information from pathology reports or radiology reports and clinical notes will, uh, is intended, is hoped that there will be access to data that was otherwise hidden in these text fields and could only therefore be extracted by a person reading each and every one, uh, which is very time consuming and expensive, of course. So um, it opens up the possibility that we might uh, unlock things, unlock pieces of information, much more uh, clinically relevant pieces of information from the data that we're collecting uh, on people as part of their care. Uh, so that's the ultimately the goal. And it's just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. So there are a few things that the that the computer has to identify. Um, so, you know, it, it can pull out things like age, you know, a 33 year old male, that, that would be fairly straightforward for it to pull out. It tries to not pull out name, of course, that's not not relevant for what uh, for uh, study, but it is uh, sometimes for uh, knowing the sex or gender of the patient. So being able to pull out pronouns, for example, um, the dates of certain tests, some of sometimes that's uh, able to be pulled out, sometimes not. The sizes, you know, those sorts of things are important, but not always so straightforward um, for, you know, for a computer to actually identify. Um, and then there are other things that sometimes come in very discreetly that are easy, like medications, for example, but people will use acronyms, you know, HTN is hypertension, you know, uh, you know, so the computer has to know that uh, you have to tell it that DM diabetes mellitus, you know, these are things that um, you could write a hundred different ways. Um, and so pulling that out in a simple format that's, that's used for research is really uh not yet possible um, and is really there's a lot of growth in this area um, so commonly what nlp natural language processing is being used for is pulling out named entities so disease states like hepatitis b or uh or breast cancer or something relationship extracting so it knows a date of a certain test uh for example so it knows ultrasound and it knows the date that it was done um, as well as negation detection, which is really, really difficult. Uh, you know, he did not have a mass identified on the CT uh, means something very different than he had a mass identified on the CT. Um, and obviously that has to be something that the computer can figure out if any of this is going to be useful. And there are lots of ways that this is being used in cancer uh, in cancer research, um, and this is obviously growing and uh, an overwhelming slide, but just to show you that it's being used in many different ways to pull out things from, you know, top left, this is imaging and pathology, treatment, procedures, staging, descriptions, how the patient's doing, you know, performance status, all of that is being pulled in and, and we're developing ways to pull those pieces of information and to be used for research. I'll briefly mention pathology. Um, pathology is tricky, very tricky. Uh, it's a very difficult specialty. Um, it's based often on visual recognition of what the pathologist sees under the slide, how it might be semi-quantitative is when they're looking at gene, gene markers like HER2 for breast cancer, for example, um, is both the intensity of the staining and the percentage of cells that have this HER2 on it it's not as cut and dry as we would like. And so is, is it really uh, challenging because there's not always perfect agreement amongst pathologists. Um, and that does make it uh, obviously challenging when you're trying to recommend treatment for patients. Um, there's also a emphasis uh, over the last many years on, you may have heard of liquid biopsy um, or trying to get uh, minimally invasive tissue samples for study. Uh, but that makes it much harder for a pathologist to actually get uh, the information that they need to make a diagnosis. Um, and so, so AI, machine learning is being used to uh, help uh, build capacity and, and uh, still allow for classification of uh, diseases and cancers in a very specific way uh, on smaller samples. Um, 
those are the big ones. You know, um, it's not like, uh, so this, the green box there, most biological features are continuous variables, um, meaning that it's, it's not like uh, there's a, a flag that says yes or no, that this cancer has, um, uh, you know, is um, fast growing. Um, there are five or 10 or 15 features that a pathologist could see that would say, yes, this is more aggressive looking. Oh, this is not so aggressive looking. And putting it all together is what humans have been doing for a long time. But as we learn more of these variables, that integration of multiple forms of data is becoming harder. Um, and that goes speaks to the biomarker question. It's very complex molecular biology that they're really studying. Um, and and so now what's happening is you, the computers are able to read whole slides. And so here's an example where essentially, you know, a patient will come in and they'll have um, have the uh, the uh, slides available and they will read it. And the way that you would test this is you'd have the pathologist read it, come up with you know their interpretation of it with all the special tests. Um, and then you could use the two different types of uh, machine learning that we had talked about, the handcrafted older style where you identify those features and put them into the, into the algorithm that, that's being used by the computer, the so-called handcrafted approach at the bottom, where they might say, you know, this is an area that, you know, that stains strongly for some protein that's important in this cancer. Um, or you just have the computer look at the slides and put it into this deep, uh, this uh, neural network approach um, where it really will look at then uh, the features for itself and come up with its own conclusions. Um, and it's fascinating to see how uh, this is now uh, being compared to humans um, and being compared to uh, across different cancers to identify really different ways of classifying tumors. So, you know, um, pathologists and oncologists might classify tumors in a, in a very specific way um, based on, you know, what looks like under the microscope um, and what certain genes are turned on or not turned on. Um, what's been recently reported is that you can then classify perhaps more accurately than those other things with, uh, with this machine learning approach. So this is a there's a couple of studies in nature where they looked at how you could classify diseases of the central nervous system based on the methylation characteristics of the DNA, which is uh, something that was done by uh, the computer-aided analysis. Um, and so I think it's just very interesting um, to see that you could continually improve on something that I think we all take for granted, which is what the diagnosis really is. You can continually improve on that as uh, as things uh, as things improve in in this space. Uh, I, so you know, omics, all I want to say, I'll show you this image. You may have seen things like this before, but basically what this is is you will take the fifty or a uh, hundred or sometimes thousands of pardon me of of um, the uh, in this case, uh, gene expression, uh, genes that are expressed, sometimes proteins that are expressed or other things that are expressed. Um, and you know, you'll see some of these are upregulated and some of them are downregulated. And to classify them um, is, is something that uh, is really only becoming very possible because of the use of machine learning for for looking at all these different factors. And they can, you can say that even though these don't perfectly match, if you see, it's not like in the top left here, all of these have the same red intensity or blue intensity um, with each gene, uh, but there's enough similarity that it would categorize them uh, together. And as you can see, these, these classically would um, classify along uh, disease states, acute lymphoblastic leukemia versus acute myeloblastic leukemia, so, or myeloleukemia. And so these are uh, very interesting things that this is now obviously 21 years old. Uh, so these are not new, but being used, uh, this is when it, one, of the, one of the original ones, but now this is being used in, uh, in many, <laughs> the majority of studies that are published in this regard use this technique. 
Lastly, around, uh, around AI, I want to talk about imaging, um, the concept of a virtual biopsy. And, uh, and so right now, of course, the patient goes in and gets a biopsy, maybe a needle or a surgical procedure. Uh, it's looked at under the microscope, as we talked about, and that tells you, you know, what you're dealing with and um, what treatments and things and what the prognosis is. All of those things are critical um, um, and rely heavily on that biopsy. Newer techniques are being developed where, uh, where patients, in fact, will go into that scanner, CT or MRI or what have you, and the features can be pulled out from an artificial intelligence um, with using artificial intelligence uh, or machine learning that will help to classify as accurately, in some ways more accurately than, uh, than a human could, even with tissue. And so that may eventually replace biopsy in some instances. Um, and there are some actually very good examples where that, uh, that's the case um, or could become the case um, over time. So here's, uh, you know, here's essentially, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing that as myself. It's so small, pardon me. Um, you know, you can identify an area of the tumor. You can see how it changes over time. And the computer helps to uh, identify whether that is disease that's progressing or is that tumor infiltrate uh, or treatment infiltrate. Um, sometimes, um, uh, you might, you know, go to an oncologist and they'll say, well, things are changed a little bit, but not enough for us to worry. Um, or, uh, or it looks a bit bigger, but we expect because of the tumor markers are down that that's related to the disease responding to treatment. And it's just, uh, uh, an inflammation around the tumor. Um, you know, these ambiguities are things that can be, uh, cleaned up essentially, um, with uh, advanced radiology techniques. Right now, we, uh, so there are publications in the brain tumor world where um, you can identify very specific MRI findings that will tell, uh, tell an oncologist whether the tumor is, has an IDH mutation, which is very important for us, or has uh, MGMT, um, promoter methylation, which is another important you know, molecular factor. So these sorts of things, are not yet common, you know, they'll need uh, big time validation. Um, and our team is actually working on that. I have a, a group of people that I work with that um, are looking at MRI for patients with glioblastoma at a, at, at a concept called pseudo progression where the cancer can, can grow uh, on MRI uh, after they get their treatment. And we actually can't tell with any certainty whether that change is disease growing or whether that's actually uh, a response to treatment that is favorable, that is good, and just happens to look bigger. It can look identical on the, on the scan. Um, it'd be really tricky for an oncologist to decide to continue treatment or not. And, uh, and so we are trying to figure that out using machine learning and these advanced MRI techniques. So I think there'll be a lot more to be said about that over time as we as we learn how to use radiology to our advantage more. Um, and these things can be combined, of course. Uh, so so the classification and expression patterns that I showed you with all the different colored dots um, can then be uh, added to what they're pulling out from radiology scans and and then you know provide a. Uh, in fact, real-time monitoring potentially of how gene expressions might change within a tumor or over time uh, for a certain patient. So that was a longer than expected foray into machine learning um, and artificial intelligence, but I think a very interesting area. The last two areas will, will only be a few slides here. Um, and and uh, so I'll spend just a minute here talking about health services research. Um, way, uh, those things listed on the left, system performance, equity, access to care, the economics of care, the quality of care, how patients are reporting their outcomes um, and, and how they're actually doing, or comparing treatments that are uh, just standard practice in one center and not standard in another, 
are things that fall under health services research. Um, a lot has been developed in this area over the last many years. There's a lot of attention being paid to it. And as I mentioned initially, a lot of more um, funding going into this so that researchers can identify the best way to uh, the best way um, to de develop the health system um, uh, and provide interventions to patients on a, on a bigger scale. So it's a really all-encompassing field that I think is going to grow further. And one of the ways that we are doing this right now, um, a team that I'm involved in, um, is, is integrating, it's called applied health services research, where essentially we are, uh, we are studying an, an intervention that we're putting into the system. And in this case, it's, a, it's a, a better way for patients to be navigated using an electronic system that we have. Um, and uh, so we want this to be in the hands of patients and in the hands of our nurse navigators. And we want to measure this benefit so that it's clear that the effort was worth it or maybe not worth it. Uh, we think it'll be worth it and it'll be more efficient for the system, but we won't know unless we measure. You know, in previous years gone by, it would just be something that was either done or not done because of a, um, because of a decision that was made. Now, I think we need more and more to be able to prove that that effort was worth it and the expenditure of dollars was really uh, what we expect it to be, especially in our healthcare system. And so that's the type of thing that I think uh, we will see and have started to see within health services research. Lastly, a little bit about clinical trials. Um, I mentioned up, up front, clinical trials are really the way that we learn. Um, and it's really true there, you know, there would not be um, very many treatments if we did not have clinical trials uh, that patients were willing to be enrolled on. And in general, they come in uh, all sorts of shapes and sizes, but in general, you start with, you know, many different drugs in a small number of patients uh, on trials, uh, kind of in the phase one here. Um, some of those drugs get through um, because they're, some of them are not safe for humans. Um, and that's a phase one study is weed, weeding out safety. Phase two classically is weeding out uh, drugs that have some efficacy in a certain patient group. So it might be for breast cancer, there's you know a drug that they're trying and they see that if there is a response or not a response. And if there is a response, then they go to a phase three study, which is looking at whether it actually improves some important outcome for that patient, like overall survival or quality of life those being the two most important things. Um, and, uh, and once it's gone through those testing phases, it, it, they, they, you know, they seek approval, but they can fail at any point along the way. And I think this is meant to show that you can, of course, start with, in fact, hundreds of or thousands of compounds and result in really just one approved product that's available. So there's a, there's a, a number of ways where this is being improved upon. And um, and so, you know, in the old design, the old way of thinking, you would have a single drug and a single cancer type. So you would have, uh, I'll pick on breast cancer, we'll say you would have a single drug or single regimen. So we'll say docetaxel for breast cancer um, and maybe a certain type of breast cancer. And you would just randomly assign half the patients get to sing that docetaxel and half of them don't get the docetaxel and you would see at the end whether it made a difference in the outcomes you care about for the patients that got the docetaxel or whether it was worse. But nowadays um, we're you may have heard of basket trials or umbrella trials where you know a basket trial is really looking at uh, a single cancer type um, with or sorry um, a single um, drug that might be able to target um, cancers of different types with the same uh, molecular change. So uh, an example might be HER2 um, being upregulated or overexpressed in a breast cancer. You might test a new drug, but HER2 is also upregulated in some esophageal and gastric cancers, for example. So you could include those as a separate cohort in your basket because it's targeting that specific mutation or change that you know is important. Um, and so you can be more efficient in testing it. You may not have very many patients with a gastric cancer that's HER2 positive, but if you can show 
that overall there's benefit with these cancers um, targeting that protein, then that's potentially very valuable. Umbrella trials, uh, slightly different, uh, where you would have multiple drugs um, and a single cancer type um, or group of cancer types that have multiple molecular derangements and you're trying to find out which is the best strategic approach. Um, and so you can test, you know, this lung cancer has EGFR and this lung cancer has uh, ALK rearrangement. Um, and so if we uh, have access to all these drugs and we have patients coming through, we can put more people onto a study and uh, measure the effect of that treatment. Um, rather than need five separate trials, uh, we would have one trial, one protocol that includes multiple drugs. So that's not very new. That's probably happened over the last 10 or so years in oncology. Uh, cancer tends to, the oncology research space tends to lead in clinical trial development. Um, newer things this year, something uh, that's that's been around um, not for very long, but really taking hold is called a Bayesian adaptive trial, where instead of one or two interventions on a clinical trial and everyone essentially getting a 50-50 or 33% chance of being randomly assigned to one arm, you actually, in, in what's called Bayesian adaptive trials, you actually will preferentially, the, the computer will preferentially select the, the, the arm of the study that's doing better. So if, uh, if in my docetaxel and breast cancer example, if the patients who get docetaxel are doing better uh, in whatever way you're measuring it, then the, the chance that the next patient gets docetaxel is going to be higher. And in that way, it can actually, you can add arms to the trial very easily and take off arms. So if no one's getting randomized to an arm because the outcomes have not been good with it, with that, that new drug or whatever it is, um, then those don't continue. Only the ones that are doing better continue. And then you can continually add arms in the same patient population to keep testing which is going to be better. And so I've got one example on the next slide. And then on the last slide, um, I want to, I'll mention something called a multi-platform trial. And I'll go through that in a bit of detail at that point. One, this, this trial is called GBM Agile. It's uh, open, I think it's a global trial actually starting to uh, be open in Canada. Um, and essentially it's what I said. So a patient comes in, they might have um, five different cohorts because there's you know someone with an IDH mutation and someone without, someone with MGMT, someone without. Um, you can have arms uh, for recurrent disease and arms for newly diagnosed disease. Um, and you can then, uh, again, pick the winner, so to speak, and continually updating, continually learning is really um, a much more efficient approach to clinical trial development and, dr and getting treatments in the hands of patients than what we used to do. And the last is, oh, the last is what's called a multi-platform Trial. This is an example I took from a, a, a colleague, Ryan Zerachansky, who's leading multiple global trials now in, uh, in COVID-19. So this is not cancer specifically, but just to show that this is something that I think is really gaining traction as a result of the changes this year, is the idea that um, each of these trials, the black boxes, so the red is where they're being run. Each of these black boxes are trial names. They are, they have basically the same research question. Does this drug work in this patient population? But if you go to the United States, you have to get this through the FDA and there's regulatory requirements. If you go to Canada, it's different. If you go to Mexico, it's different. The EU, it's all different. So you can actually um, split the study up with the same question, but have a different flavor that uh, allows you to activate it in one country Versus, an, versus what it would look like slightly differently um, for another country, but still answer the same question. And that's more efficient because then you're not having to um, uh, iteratively improve or put out protocol amendments for, uh, you know, a new country comes on board and there needs to be some change to the consent form or there's some change that needs to happen. It can all be much more efficient. And what he's developed well, along with his teams is how the data then gets pulled in, integrated and pooled for analysis, um, both for is this drug working or not from all of the different centers, 
or is it causing trouble, the, the, this common data safety monitoring board? And so there's a lot of efficiencies that you can develop um, with the use of these. And I think in oncology, we're going to embrace ideas like this uh, globally because it's going to make a difference as to how fast we can get patients on trial and how fast we can get answers. And so that's, that's the last thing I wanted to say, um, uh, or at least talk about. I'm happy to entertain questions. I want to, again, say thank you to everyone. I'm sorry, I went a little bit longer than I intended. <laughs>